Amen. You may be seated. Aloha, my name is Scott Custer. Uh, I'm the lead pastor at International Church, where together we aim to help people love God, love people, serve, and engage the world. We're really, really glad you are with us today. Uh, I want to start off by telling you about one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. It was by uh, a guy named Rodney Stark. He wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. Now, Stark is a sociologist of history and religion, uh, means, which basically means he studies the social factors that have existed throughout history and the present that lead to a religion growing or not growing, lead towards certain religious movements taking off and others not, and, and kind of why do, does religion and growth progress in the way that it does? As believers, we tend to look through history and obviously see God's hand at work in, in all matters and the spiritual truth that Christianity provides. But he, at the time that he wrote this book, at least, he was not a believer. He was an agnostic. And he wanted to kind of understand what were some of the sociological factors. And it was fascinating to read this book from that person's perspective. Why did Christianity grow in the first century? And in his book, Stark says... Christianity grew the way religion generally grows, which is it happens usually along social networks and through childbirth. People tend to convert along family lines and social networks, but, he says, Christianity also benefited from several social boosts because the Christians were responding to the Roman culture differently than the Romans were responding within the Roman culture. Some examples of how Christians were responding differently uh, to, to various crises in different ways. The first one is abortion and infanticide. Infanticide was uh, something the Greco-Romans did not shy away from. Uh, Romans had no problems um, aborting or getting rid of an unwanted baby. That kind of technology existed in the first century as well. If a child was uh, physically or mentally deficient, it was not seen as wrong to kill the child, either actively or passively, simply by leaving that child somewhere. But Christians in the first century, they said, no, we, we speak out against those kinds of practices. The Christians cared for the voiceless, as they often do today. They welcomed mentally and physically deficient people, according to social standards, into their community. They treated them and all humans with incredible dignity. That was new. That was different from the way the world did it. There's also, of course, the crisis of persecution. Now, Stark says that persecution was not as widespread or persistent as sometimes Christians think that it was, or sometimes as we imagine it to be. He says persecution usually came in short and intermittent spells. It would come in in different waves. And while persecution was meant to stamp out Christianity it usually had the opposite effect. When they tried to persecute and stamp it out, it only grew even more. And his theory is that he believes Christians were holding more tightly to their beliefs when they were being persecuted. Things like a public martyrdom showed how committed Christians were to their faith. When someone was murdered in the, in the Colosseum by wild animals, that showed that Christians had a different belief about life and the afterlife than the Greco-Roman world around them. Not only that, but Christians were notorious for not fighting back against their persecutors, nor did they seem to fear death. Another way that Christians responded differently was uh, when a plague would hit, or, or various social crises. During the early centuries of Christianity growing, during the first uh, three, four centuries uh, after Christ's death and resurrection, a series of, of natural disasters struck Europe. Things like earthquakes, some serious epidemics went through and disrupted the Roman Empire. Stark thinks that this is one of the most underappreciated and unrecognized, underrecognized reasons for Christianity's growth, how they responded to plagues. He says, first of all, and I quote, Christianity offered a much more satisfactory account of why these terrible times had fallen upon humanity. And... It projected a hopeful, even enthusiastic portrait 
of the future, end quote. He says these explanations, they helped Christians and they helped people cope with disaster. Why does it happen? Well, Christian says we're in a fallen world. That in turn helped uh, Christians understand and respond to it in a more attractive way. So some people were converted because they're like, wait, this makes more sense of actual human experience. Secondly, during the plague, the, the plagues and the social crises, most people who could afford to fled the cities. The rich, the famous, everybody who could get out of Dodge did. They left the cities. But the Christians didn't. The Christians stayed. They believed that God had sovereignly put them in this place at that time to do whatever they could to alleviate the suffering of the many. This selfless attitude was not common in the Roman world. So that orientation toward the good of others influenced a lot of people. So some people converted just by the model that that provided, that you care for those. You don't run from the disaster. But it also meant that Christians were going to be the most likely to develop and share antibodies to various diseases when they came into contact with them. So this meant that the Christians were literally, physically, the most likely to survive any epidemic that came along. Thirdly, the massive number of those people who died in the pestilence, and it really was a massive number. Conservatives think that conservative estimates are about a third of the Roman Empire itself was wiped out during these epidemics in the first few centuries. So a third of the population is gone. This disrupts all kind of normal social bonds that would have attached people together. You know, your family's gone, they're your neighbors, people that you normally would bond with were suddenly passed away. Well, because Christians were more likely to stay in the city and because Christians were more likely to survive the plagues, people knew more and more and more Christians. So they had more and more social networks that involved other Christians and so thus came to the faith. So it's just, it was a fascinating book to, to me to kind of consider from that perspective, why did Christianity grow? One of my main takeaways from the book was that Christianity grew because Christianity was different. Christianity didn't need to be coercively or militarily forced on anybody, as other religions usually around the world have traveled by those means, by a conflict and the sword is how it grew, but not, not Christianity. See, Christianity was different. Because Christians were different. Christians have always been strange to the world. We believe strange things. We act in some strange and odd way. Christians have historically had unique interactions with the world. We've acted in an attitude that has said that we are for the world. We are for our surrounding communities. We are for our neighbors, our friends, and our family members. We're not just out here for ourselves. Why? Why are Christians, why do we believe that? Because we believe that's how God sees humanity. That God is for people. He is for culture. He is for communities. And if God is for people and culture and communities, then we, his people, should be as well. That's what we've been talking about this month, and we're going to keep talking about for the next couple of weeks in uh, this sermon series that's called For Oahu. We're considering what does it mean to be for Oahu. If God is for Oahu, for this place where he has put us, how ought we to interact with our island? Last week, we said that being for Oahu, first of all, means that we are gospel-shaped people, that, that we are people who are committed to believing and sharing and living out the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, today, I'm going to switch from kind of the, okay, the gospel is kind of the why. That's the foundation for why we engage with the world, why we should get out there and interact, because we're told by Jesus to go and proclaim the gospel throughout all of creation. So today we're going to look at, okay, we have maybe the why, now how do we start going about that? How does God want his gospel-shaped people to interact with the world? And then next week, if you come back for us, we'll kind of look at, okay, what do we actually do? So we'll have the why, the how, and the what over these three weeks. 
So for today, we're going to kind of explore the question, what does our relationship with the world and culture look like? What should it be? All right, the gospel tells us we should have one. So what should that look like? How should Christians interact with their community? What does it look like for us, believers of Christ in this church, to be for the island where God has put us? Thankfully, Jesus has not left us without instructions on these matters. And one of the places that he gives us some insight is in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, uh, either hard copy or old school, you want to use a Bible that's in chair in front of you, or you can go new school with your own personal widescreen or some device, I invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 5. This section is Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. So during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to the ones who are going to proclaim Christ and the good news about him after he has ascended back to heaven. So these are the disciples. They're going to follow Jesus around for the next three years, and they're going to learn what it means to live for God through Christ, what he says, what he does. So in verse 13... Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, modern electricity has totally ruined the metaphors here. Thanks a lot, Nikola Tesla. See, the disciples may have been tempted to think, as Jesus starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he starts talking about the Beatitudes, he starts talking about this radical community that he is building that's so different, and they may have been tempted to think, okay, these countercultural views that we are hearing from Jesus, you know what? He probably wants us, his followers, to be separate from the world, to separate out, be separatistic, be be quasi-monastic, live like monks away from the dirty influence of the world. But here Jesus seems to proclaim precisely the opposite of that expectation. With, With this metaphor, Jesus is saying he wants them to be in the world, to be part of it, to seek to preserve what is good and moral out there in the world. And he does that by talking about salt. Now, we primarily think of salt as a taste-giving spice. You know, its primary purpose for us is is for food and taste. Its primary purpose in the first century, however, was food preservation. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have a way to keep food lasting over a long period of time. So they used salt to preserve it. When you put Salt on food, especially meat, it sinks itself down into the meat. It disappears. It dissolves. It goes into that meat and preserves it. It keeps the meat good for a lot longer. It becomes part of the meat. That's the metaphor Jesus is using. Once you put salt on meat, you can't separate it back out again. It's on there. It's part of it. And Jesus is saying that's how he wants us to be. He wants his people to be in and among the people, among the world. But Jesus does give a warning after he says, go be the salt of the earth. He says, but if you lose your saltiness, are you really good for anything? If salt loses its saltiness, what does that mean? Well, most likely Jesus is referring to the tendency to families would have a big bag of salt, and it wouldn't be very hard in an agrarian society for that salt to become contaminated with dirt or with rocks or with other things. And when you stopped having pure salt, you didn't want to throw salt and dirt on your food. So it's primarily saying that, hey, salt is good, but only if it's pure salt. If it gets over-contaminated with other things, that, that's not useful for food preservation. If it gets contaminated, we, you can't really use that. You can trample it underfoot, treat it like dirt. 
So there's a caution. Jesus says, hey, I want you to go be in the meat. Go be in the world. But there's a caution. Don't get too contaminated. And then he builds on that caution by then following up and saying, you are the light of the world. All right, this is weird because Jesus is pretty much saying the exact opposite, it feels like, of what he just said. In addition to being commanded to be salt, we're told we should also be light. Jesus says we are the light, that we have the light, because both of those are true. Anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they have Christ, the light of the world, in them. We have him. The Bible says we become like him. We are lights like he is the light. The word Christian actually literally means little Christs. So the light is something that we have. I think it's the good news of the gospel, but it's also something that we are. We are the light of the world. But it's interesting because salt is something that fuses itself with something else in order to preserve it. But light, on the other hand, light coexists with nothing else that's like it. Where there is darkness, there is no light. Light is its own entity, right? There's no such thing in the world as anti-light. There's no light and against light. There's light and there's darkness, which is merely the absence of light. That's it. All right, so light does not coexist with darkness. If you have light, you have nothing else. There is no opposite to it. There is no fusing. It is its own entity, its own separate thing. And where there is light, there is no darkness. Light is about being different from the world around us. Light is about standing out, not fitting in. And it's strange. Salt is about preserving and uniting but light is about illuminating and standing out. Well, Jesus, which is it? <laughs> what are you wanting us to do here? Right? Do, you, do you feel the tension of like, well, wait a minute. This doesn't quite make sense. This, this feels a bit paradoxical, right? Because we might tend to be one or the other, but Jesus calls his followers to be both salt and light. And he showed us himself how to do that. The author of this book in the Bible, of this gospel, is a guy named Matthew, which is why it's called Matthew's Gospel. And I think Matthew is living proof of Jesus doing exactly this. See, Matthew, you see, was a hated tax collector and a sinner. He was a, a bad dude. Right? This is a guy who had betrayed his fellow Jews. He had sold himself out to the Romans for money and the promise of wealth. And yet Jesus goes to this guy and invites him to become one of his disciples. Right? Jesus was salt. He was not afraid to start a meaningful relationship with Matthew, inviting him to be one of his followers. But Jesus was also light in that he called Matthew out of that situation and into a new relationship with God, salt and light. Or think maybe about when Jesus started the church. It's the story in, in Acts chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you don't have to turn there, but go read it sometime. It's the story of, of kind of how the church began. Jesus could have started the church in a million different ways, but he decided to do it by sending the Holy Spirit on his disciples who were in a house in Jerusalem at the time that there was a huge festival going on. So in one of the busiest cities during one of the busiest times of the year, that's where God says, I want to start my church. Right in the thick of things. Because the church is meant to be salt in and among the people, but yet light. Because the very next thing they go do is go outside and preach the gospel, and over 3,000 people believe the message and are baptized. So there's this salt, be in the people, but light, but bring this something, thing that is different to. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. I'm going to say right up here, there, there's some tension here in trying to fulfill 
what it looks like to have a right relationship with culture and with the world around us. There's tension between salt and light. There's tension to being in the world, but not of the world. And if you were with us last week, I think this fits in really closely with what we discussed about the fact that there's three ways to respond to God. There's three broad ways to respond to God. Either we trust the gospel, that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to God. We believe that he is our Savior. Or there's the path of irreligion or relativism that says, I don't need a Savior. Or there's the path of religion, the path of moralism that says, I will be my own Savior. Well, irreligion and relativism are always going to push believers to be in the world and of the world. Hey, go be salt. That's going to be the relativist's message. But on the other hand, somebody who's religious, somebody who is very moral, well, these are going to foment more self-righteous attitudes, that we're going to be out of the world, and we're going to be against the world. We're going to tell it everything it's doing wrong. That's light. Do you know anybody like that? But the gospel, the gospel says, no, there is a third way. There is another path that Christ offers. The gospel compels us to be in the world, but not of the world. To be both salt and light. Let me try to illustrate this maybe a little bit more with um, these, these three approaches. I want to illustrate this with three triangles. Some of you who have been here a while may remember I, I pulled out these three triangles three years ago. I went and looked it up. It's been three years. So if these look familiar, I'm impressed with your memory. But uh, for everybody else who doesn't remember, has never seen these, th- these were helpful for me, kind of three ways visually to look at how the church, how Christians can interact and respond to culture how we can interact with our island. What would it mean for us to be for Oahu? What's the difference here? I think the first attitude, this one of salt, is an attitude of being of Oahu, right? Of being of the world, of the culture. And the way these people think is that they put culture above everything else. Culture is primary. Culture is going to drive the church, and culture is going to drive the message. It's going to drive the type of gospel, the type of message that we give. Now, when we are of Oahu, we are acting as salt, but not light. We make culture the center of our interaction. We embrace the world. We compromise. We become cowards. We don't want to say or do anything that might cause us to stick out or might cause offense. In so doing, our message, our gospel, becomes a gospel of relativism. This sterilizes us. We lose our voice. We lose our distinction because we have nothing to say. This is the path of liberalism or the path of antinomianism, which just means anti-law, that there's, there's no right, there's no wrong, so therefore we don't have anything to say about what is right or what is wrong. There's no difference between the church and the world. This is a path that leads the church to just think, look, act, speak, and be just like the culture around us. See, this is salt without light. This is grace without truth. This is embracing the world. Right? This is uh, an attitude of being of Oahu. Now, on the other side, we could take an attitude that says we are a church that is against Oahu. We are not for this place. Now, very, very, very few churches are actually going to get on their stage and say, we are against our culture and our world. Ah, down with them. Very few people are actually going to say this. They're not verbally going to say that they're against their communities. But their attitudes and their behaviors, it's going to say something else. It's going to communicate disdain. It's going to communicate condemnation to the world and nothing but condemnation. Their words and and their attitudes just teach moralism. Teach this idea of religion that you are bad and stop being bad. The church in this model is putting itself at the center. Saying we the church will decide 
what is right in culture and what is right in our message. We are above both of these. What you end up preaching is a gospel of moralism, a gospel of rules. And the church being above the culture just leads to rebuking and condemning. This is going to mean that as Christians, we just have an attitude of enduring the world because we have to. We're just going to kind of like get into our bunker and just hunker down until Jesus comes home where we can finally leave. The world is this nasty, gross, terrible place that we just have to endure. Let's pull our family, our kids, let's get everything out of that world as much as possible. Again, they're not going to say that that's an attitude of being against culture, but that's kind of what comes across. That's how people feel. That these types of Christians tend to have attitudes of, of fighting. They tend to live in fear of the world. They don't want to interact. They're just going to shout out rules and hope that the world like, comes across the river onto their side. But they're not going to go meet them anywhere. When we do this, we focus on external expressions of sin. So that's why our gospel becomes one of just rules and behavior of moralism. We want the world to behave a certain way, and until they do, we are going to be critics and condemn it. And we're going to condemn it from a distance. The arts are bad. Government is bad. Media is bad. Schools are bad. Everything's bad over there in the world. Yeah, no one's going to listen to that voice. No one. That's being light without salt. That is being truth without grace. This is enduring the world. But there is a third way. We don't have to be of Oahu or against Oahu. We can actually be for Oahu. Jesus in his gospel message calls us to a different way, and it calls us to put the gospel of Jesus Christ at the center. That the good news, that we are gospel-shaped people that allow the gospel to be above us. The gospel tells us what to do, how to think, how to live. If you want to hear unpack that, just go back and listen to last week's sermons, what we talked about last week. But we say the gospel stands above the church and above culture. So we engage in and with culture. We aim to be life-giving and redemptive because we love people. We seek the best for everyone in our community, whether they like us or not. Whether they look like us or not. Whether they think like us or not. Whether they smell like us or not. Whether they believe or behave like us or not, it doesn't matter. We are for people no matter what, no matter who they are and what they've done, just as Jesus Christ is for you and for me, no matter what, no matter who we are and what we've done. So the gospel says we are compelled to engage with others the way God has engaged with us. So in this scenario, we allow the culture to inform the church. We allow the culture in some ways to shape how we behave and how we do things like, hey, we should have a room with air conditioning because this is where we live and we want people to be comfortable. And this is important in the 21st century. Whereas 200 years ago, culture would not have, why is this room so cold, right? So you adapt. We allow culture to inform the church and how, how we do stuff, absolutely. But it's so that the church, in turn, can reform culture under the heading of the gospel. So that the church can work to redeem culture, to recognize what is good out there, that God has created a good world, so there is a lot of good out there. And we want to build on that and what God has already put there. So the culture informs the church. The church reforms and redeems the culture by sharing and living the gospel. Right? Every church is affected by culture, and it should be, which is why a church in South Dakota is going to look different than a church in South America or South Africa. They're going to think and do and act in different ways. We always have to understand, we are in a culture. We think, well, culture's over there, and I'm over here. You are shaped by culture far more than you can even imagine. Culture is everything. Culture is the way we think and act and the clothes we wear, the way we sit, how we sit. We're all facing up here. Like, so much of this stuff is determined by the culture we have grown up in. 
So even the idea that we could separate ourselves from culture is already a bit naive. No, we are in a culture, but we allow ourselves to somewhat come out of that culture, to be informed by it, to allow the gospel to shape us so that we can go back into the culture too, so that we can go and engage again. We allow culture to inform us, but we don't stay out. We go back. We go back to be full of salt and light, to be full of grace and truth. That is not enduring and it's not embracing, that's engaging the world. And I think this is what Jesus did, and I think this is what Jesus calls us to do. We don't merge with the world and act just like them, talk just like them, think and do things just like them. We are not of the world. But we also don't hide from the world. We don't just call them out on all their sins and just yell at people from afar. That is being against the world. Instead, we are in the world, but we're not of it. We are for it. We engage. Right? Gospel-shaped people engage the world. That's, that's the type of relationship I think the New Testament calls us to. One of engagement, not blind acceptance and not blind refusal to engage. We don't go all in, we don't go all out. We engage. We bring salt and light into our engagement with the world. My dream is that our island neighbors would say, you know, we may not agree with everything that International Church stands for, but if they ever left our island, it would break our heart. To be salt and light means that we engage the world and we love people. We don't just check out and be cowards. We don't just hide out and be critics. We step out to engage with grace and truth. This is why we're going to go serve our community in love in two weeks from now on, on Sunday, July 28th for our church out. Because the church isn't meant to always stay inside. Sometimes the church needs to leave the building. Because gospel-shaped people don't hide out. Gospel-shaped people go and engage the world. So let's talk about what might that actually look like. All right, so if, if we maybe take some different topics and different uh, concepts of, of, that are out there in the world and say, okay, what are the three different ways... That is Christians, we could interact with the world around that, right? How, how do we live gospel-shaped engagement as opposed to being of the world or against the world? What does that look like? To make sure we don't fall into the relativist, irreligious ways of engaging or interacting, or we also make sure we don't fall into the moralist, religious views of simply enduring the world. But we don't want to be of culture against, but for culture. We want to engage, not just embrace or endure. So I want to give maybe a, a few examples, try and put a little bit of flesh on this. I realize this is a, maybe a bit theoretical uh, this morning, so I want to try and bring this down a little bit for us. How, how does being gospel-shaped look in different areas of life? Let's look, for example, at love and relationships. Love and relationships in the world. Now, religion and moralists are going to put all sorts of rules and categories on relationships and love. What is and is not acceptable, what, who is and is allowed to do what, when, and with whom. Moralists are going to be very rules-driven. They prioritize their way of doing things. And when a relationship fails, the moralists usually fall into the blame game. Well, it's because the other person didn't keep the right rules. It's because they're so difficult. They're the problem. Moralists love to point out the flaws in other people. These are people who tend to secretly, they, they idolize relationships. Relationships are so important to moralists because this is how they get their identity. They are shaped by who they are because, well, if I have a relationship with so-and-so, I have certain status or I get certain benefits from it. A moralist tends to use love and relationships to prop themselves up in a way. They need the relationship and they need it to go a certain way and be a certain thing. 
in order to feel fulfilled. Right? That's how a moralist will engage with love and relationship. Now, a relativist, on the other hand, well, relativism is more about entering into a negotiated partnership for mutual benefit. Love and relationships, I mean, they're, they're good. You know, we, we're going we're gonna to enjoy them. We're going to take what's good. And when things get bad, well, then, then you're out. Right, then the relativists leave because the relativist only wants to stay in relationships as long as it doesn't cost anything. When things get hard, well, relationships are replaceable. Well, I guess this thing's done. I will move on. I had a, I had a friend who uh, one time was walking along the beach when there was a wedding happening at the beach. So I was like, oh, he's cool. He's a pastor. So he went and just kind of stood behind a tree and listened in as the couple was just about to exchange their vows when they looked deeply into each other's eyes and said, I vow to love you as long as our love shall last. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) I will love you as long as I feel like loving you. I will love you as long as it's convenient, as long as it's easy, as long as nothing better comes along. Yeah, I'll stick around. But love and relationships, they're interchangeable. They're not even all that important. If it's not working out, you walk away, you find another one. There's many more fish in the sea. It's all interchangeable. Well, the gospel would say, no, we engage in love and relationships differently in society. We engage selflessly because it's not about us. We engage with sacrifice and with commitment. But we also work for healthy relationships between people. We want to be close to people. When there is friction, when there's damage, we don't walk away and we don't blame them. We go and engage and say, hey, how can we repair this relationship? How can we work on this? We value relationships, but we don't value them so much because we need them to somehow prop ourselves up. We don't need another person to define who we are because our identity is secure in Christ. Our identity is set that I am a beloved child of God and no other relationship is going to define me, only that one. So it means that Christians, we don't need somebody else to convince us that we're acceptable. So we can love a person. We can love them so much that we're willing to confront them, bring light. But we love them so much that we don't just run away when things get hard. Salt. We want to preserve So we love and engage relationships because we see them as valuable even when they're difficult. Does that kind of make sense, right? So gospel is going to lead a different way than moralism or relativism will. Same with the topic of sexuality. So the social moralist is generally going to see sex as this dirty thing that we shouldn't talk about or acknowledge at all, right? It's this dangerous impulse that we have that is, you know, Somehow Satan's fault as opposed to part of God's design for humanity. These are people who publicly denounce sexual sinners as if they weren't one. These are people who bring light. They're against culture. They're just trying to endure their time on earth as sexual creatures. On the other hand, the relativist, the pragmatist over here says, well, sex is nothing but a human appetite. It's really not that important. You guys are making way too big of a deal out of this. It is what it is. We're just going to go engage. We're going to go have fun. It's not a big deal. So the relativist minimizes sex simply as a biological or physical appetite. And it takes this laissez-faire attitude that the world also has toward sex. That's being of culture. That's being salt and embracing the world's beliefs. But again, there's a third path. There's the path of the gospel that says we should be for people, the path of engaging, the path that speaks truth and offers grace to sinners. Because the gospel tells us that sexuality is actually meant to reflect the self-giving of Jesus Christ. That when he gave himself completely without conditions to us, And in the same way, husband and wife give themselves completely and without conditions to each other. And when we give ourselves to one another sexually, we should not do that without also giving ourselves 100% to one another socially, legally, emotionally, in every other way possible. Because the Bible says that when two, this through sex is when two become one. 
We believe that sex is a powerful and good gift that God has given us. When we give ourselves in sex, it should be in a totally committed, permanent relationship of marriage. Right? That's what the Bible says. There are sexual ethics. There is a boundary. So this means that sleeping with someone you're not married to or, or engaging in pornography is harmful to you and to the other person because it's going to short circuit exactly the opposite of what God has designed sex to be about. We make sex about getting, whereas God has designed sex to be about giving. And when we invert that, to use phrases like, well, did you get any? Did you get lucky? It's all about getting as opposed to giving, which is not the gospel's design. So we can speak to that, but we can also certainly relate, recognizing that there's not a single person in this room or on this planet who is not sexually broken. There's not a single person who's whose desires are always pure and always constant all the time. We need Jesus. We need Jesus to forgive us, to reform us, and to help us live the way he wants us to. That's engaging. Hey, I get it, me too, but there is a better way. What about the topic of of race and culture in the world? Well, the moralist conservative bias is to elevate their own culture, to say my culture is the one that matters the most. These moralists tend to feel superior to others. They have this impulse of self-justifying pride. Moralists tend to idolize culture as being supreme. They think that they are right and others are wrong, right? We are light. If you're darkness, we're going to stay over here. We're just going to endure you. On the other hand, relativists, the liberal approach is to go, all race and culture, it's all the same. There's no right and there's no wrong. And because there's no right and there's no wrong, because there's no such thing as absolute truth, there's no one person telling another person what is good or bad. Nobody is right. Let's all just be, let's all just get along. That's salt without light. But the gospel, on the other hand, leads us to recognize that all cultures are both good and bad. Every culture is going to have some of each. So it frees us as gospel-shaped people to be critical of any and all culture where criticism is necessary. We are even free to criticize our own culture to say that our culture does not have everything right. The way we do things is not always right. But because we do believe in absolute truth, we do believe in what God says and teaches, we also think there is a standard. And some cultures might adhere to that standard better than others, but we can have that conversation, recognizing no culture is perfect. We are morally superior to nobody because the gospel says we are all saved by grace alone. None of us have deserved it. None of us have earned anything. The gospel is this grand leveler. Both sin and grace strip every one of our boast. We're all sinners. We're all in need of grace. And so Christianity, on one hand, is universal, right? This liberal thing that we want everybody to come. Christianity goes, yeah, absolutely. Christianity is open to anybody and everybody. But the moralists are right in that however that comes through one door, It is an exclusivity of in Christ alone. Jesus says he is the only way to get to the Father. So it is Christianity is both universal for all and yet also exclusive in that it takes faith in Christ alone. But that offer is open to any person who'd believe. So gospel-shaped Christians, we're going to exhibit moral conviction about what is right in racial and cultural relations. But we are going to do that with compassion and a lot of flexibility. So we're going to engage that culture with grace and with truth, with salt and with light. What about social things like class and poverty? So a moralist conservative bias is going to be toward human responsibility. Right? This is the poor are poor because they've made bad choices. It's their own fault. They should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They should go get a job. They should go get to work. They or their parents are responsible for their 
socioeconomic failure. That's a moralist. The relativist liberal approach, however, is going to blame the social structures. No, this person, it's not their fault. Look at the social structures. Look at the environment that they've grown up in. Look at the laws that have been unfair and unjust. Look at the history that has created various socioeconomic classes. So this group downplays personal responsibility and says it's social responsibility. It's everybody else's fault that this person's poor. They're merely a victim. They're not responsible for their failure for their failure, somebody else is. Now, the gospel gives us a third way. The gospel calls us to be humble, free from moral superiority, because we know that we were spiritually bankrupt. And it is only Jesus who freely gave us all of his righteousness that we have anything. It is because of his generosity that we are who we are. So when we engage with the world on this topic, the gospel should lead us to be gracious people. We're not worried too much about people getting what they deserve because we did not get what we deserve. We are aware that nobody gets what they deserve when they accept the grace that comes through Christ. We recognize that there's truth on both sides. Yes, there is human responsibility, and there's individual sin nature that leads people to make poor choices that have very real consequences. And we can also look at culture and go, there are unjust laws and attitudes that prevail toward the poor. And as Christians, not only do we decry that, but we should align ourselves with the exact opposite. James says, has God not chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Our God is a God who is the great leveler. He wants to bring the rich, proud people down. He wants to bring the poor and the oppressed people up. When Isaiah describes the future that that he sees, the future that Jesus is going to bring, he talks about mountains being torn down and valleys being lifted up. And I I was really bummed when I read that passage because I love mountains. I'm like, Jesus, don't get rid of the mountains. They're so pretty. Well, he's using a metaphor. The valley is where the poor people live, where you get sun for maybe two, three hours a day. That's where all the hard work is. But rich people back then, as today, well, they live in the mansions up on the hills, don't they? Jesus is going to bring the hills down. He's going to bring the valleys up. So the gospel inclines us to be respectful toward the poor. Not just respectful, to actually care about them and align ourselves with them. To say, what are they facing? How can we help? either personally or socially. The gospel alone produces a humble respect and and a solidarity in us with the poor because we recognize that we have all been spiritually poor and we've been made rich in Christ. One more. What about witness and evangelism? What about this idea that we should go out into culture, share the gospel with people so that they would convert to faith in Jesus? Well, the moralist believes in proselytizing, in witnessing. The moralist believes in evangelism, but they believe in it because we are right and you are wrong. Which, of course, wins absolutely nobody over. (laughs) Very unwinsome attitude. That kind of approach is, at best, offensive. Usually very degrading toward other people. On the other hand, the relativist, pragmatist approach is to deny the legitimacy of proselytizing. No, we shouldn't witness. No, we shouldn't evangelize and share our faith with anybody. Why? Because there's no absolute truth. Right? There's no absolute truth. How are we right and somebody else wrong? We could never, ever make any such claim that there is a true way. So they oppose evangelism. There was a recent study by Barna that actually says 45% of millennials who identify themselves as evangelical Christians, which you won't find a ton of millennials who are brave enough to even do that, 45% of millennial evangelical Christians consider it morally wrong to evangelize. They think it is wrong for them to share their faith with somebody so that that person might come to faith in Christ. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, I guess I kind of think my guess is that they've just listened to the moralists so much 
that they can't stand this. They don't want to be associated with these people who we are right, you are wrong, we're righteous, you're unrighteous, we're clean, you're dirty. I think they've listened to that and have run so far from it that they've run all the way over here and be like, you know what, I'm not going to tell anybody. I don't want to be like that or sound like that or look like that. My millennial friend, I get that impulse. I really do. I totally do. But you've got to be careful. We are salt and light. The gospel is a message that is meant to be shared. Jesus doesn't just want us to go out there and love people and never tell them about him. It is a message that is meant to be shared so that a person can believe it. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, don't be a crazy jerk, right? Being a jerk for Jesus is still being a jerk. Don't be a jerk. The 11th commandment, I feel like that one should have been in there, right? Like the first 10 and then also just don't be a jerk. Like, because you can maybe do the first 10 and still be snotty. So don't do that. That's how a moralist engages evangelism. But somebody who's gospel-shaped is going to be different. Because the gospel is going to produce a trait, these traits in a person. As gospel-shaped people, yes, we are compared to show, to, compelled to share the gospel, but not out of hatred, not out of guilt, not out of gaining something for ourselves. We share the gospel out of generosity and out of love. We are freed from the fear of being ridiculed by others because we know we already have God's favor and there's nothing man can do about that. We know that our dealings with others should reflect humility because we know that we are saved by grace alone. It is only the humble who can be saved. Only the humble who can accept the free gift of forgiveness that comes through Jesus. Only the humble will become Christians. So therefore, we should be humble. We should be courteous. We should be careful with people, recognizing they are people whom God loves, whom he made, and absolutely should be treated with respect and dignity, whether they agree with us or not. We also realize that we do not have to push them. We do not have to coerce them. Because it's only God's grace that opens human hearts. It's not going to be our eloquence. It's not going to be our persistence. It's not even going to be the words that we say. God's going to do it. We just need to obey. So together, those traits are going to produce gospel-shaped people who not only make for really great neighbors, but even winsome evangelists. Gospel-shaped people are not going to be the heavy moralists, but they are going to recognize that witnessing is still good. And Pastor Dennis already mentioned it in the announcements, but I'll put this one up there too. What about the environment? How should Christians think, feel, and approach the natural world that God has created? How should we engage on this topic? It's one of those things that tends to divide moralists and relativists, conservativists and, and those leaning more liberal. This is one of those topics that's a little bit tough. So that's why we're going to have a class on it for four weeks to have kind of a thorough discussion. Uh, Caleb Brown is going to study at Oxford this coming fall on the topic of faith and environmental ethics. So this is his wheelhouse of what he does. And so I asked him if he would teach a class for four Sundays from 9 to 10 a.m. in the fellowship hall starting August 4th. I hope you'll join us. I'm planning to be there. But we're going to ask this question, what do, how do gospel-shaped people engage on the topic of environment? You'll find details for that in your bulletin as well. So do you kind of see how this works? How gospel-shaped people engage in a way that's different? Gospel-shaped people don't just embrace. Gospel-shaped people don't just endure. Gospel-shaped people should engage the world. Think carefully, thoughtfully, graciously. The gospel has a profound effect on how we do things. And we want to be both salt and light, full of grace and truth, not just one or the other. So what might that look like in your life? Any topic I've touched on today that maybe God's pointing his finger at for you that goes, hey, there's maybe some work we can do here something he's talking to you about is maybe he's asking you to be more courageous in stepping out and sharing the gospel. Maybe he's reminding you of a conversation where you're maybe a bit too harsh. 
Then he wants you to go back and have that conversation. What would this look like in your life? Are you somebody who tends to put the church up at the top, which leads you to be a critic of culture and a gospel of moralism? Or do you tend to put culture up at the top and find yourself compromising your faith in ways you don't even mean to? Or is the gospel firmly on top? Are you gospel-shaped? Are you allowing yourself to be informed by culture so that you might be part of God's plan to reform culture? What is God saying to you about this? Is there an attitude correction? Is there something in your heart? Where is he calling you to engage in your community this week? And what about as a church? What, what are things we as a church can do to engage more with our community, with our island? If we were to up and leave now, would most of the island even notice? How can we be growing in being both salt and light. Well, one thing we're attempting is church out in a couple weeks. It's a start. We're going to see how it goes. <laughs> right? That's the goal. We want to go engage. So please do register. Get in your t-shirt size. We'll get everybody into teams. And uh, the plan is we'll have everybody in a team by next week. So you will have a week advance as to what team you're on, what you're going to be doing, and where you're going to be going. So we'll try to get that information to you as fast as possible, but we need to know if you're going to be here. And also helps us plan food, shirts, teams, all that kind of stuff. So register, church app, inchurch.com, our website. Uh, talk to me, open an email that we've sent you in the last two weeks, and there'll probably be a link in there as well. Because we want to be a church that as a whole engages the world, but we also want to be a church that's full of individual believers who are willing to engage the world. People who are not of Oahu or against Oahu, but people who are for Oahu. Let's be people who are full of salt and light. People who are full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord God, Lord, we recognize and admit our shortcomings in this area. Lord, it is so easy for us to fall into one attitude of it's just so much less messy if we could just go join the world in all that they're doing. It might feel easier. It might just feel easier if we could just reject the world, if we could just call out to them and just tell them to get over here and just agree with us. Jesus, help us do the harder path. Help us go the narrow way that follows you through the middle that says we want to be gospel-shaped. We want to engage the world. We want everyone everywhere to know you, to worship you, to experience salvation that only comes through you. So help us to follow you, Jesus. Help us to do this better this week. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.